Am I trapped here? In what way? Like if it turns out I hate this and I want to quit, is that an option? Well, since this perceptual version of you only exists at Lumen, I mean, quitting would effectively end your life. I mean, in so much as you've come to know it. This video is brought to you by Mubi, a curated streaming service showing exceptional films from around the globe. Get a whole month free at mubi.com slash skip intro. Severance, the Apple TV Plus show that finished its first season in April, is a big ol' mood. Before we hop on that, let's chat about something I bet you have heard of, the work-life balance. To start, imagine yourself as a seesaw. Ow! I'm not sure any show has more perfectly captured the concept of work in 2022. The show takes place in and around Lumen Industries, a massive corporation where employees are severed, a medical procedure that divides their memories between work and life. I have, of my own free accord, elected to undergo the procedure colloquially known as severance. I give consent for my perceptual chronologies to be surgically split separating my memories between my work life and my personal life. When you go down the elevator to work, the camera gets wonky and characters stop remembering their life on the outside. As a result, each character is really two different people. They're innie and they're outie. I guess I went home last night, but I don't know if home is a house or an apartment or if I live with a family. I like to think my outie lives on like a riverboat. I'm sorry, outies are... They're us on the outside. For the Audi, there is no memory of work. Just as quickly as they clock in, they're clocking out. Sounds pretty great if you ask me. Speak for yourself. That's, uh, that's my innie. Uh, they do all the editing and writing for these videos. I'm just the, uh, I'm just the face of the operation. For innies, the work never stops. See you tomorrow, Heli. They're tied to that office, so as quickly as they end their day and walk out the door, they're walking in again, starting a fresh new hell. Am I dead? No. This isn't like hell or something? No. Then why the f can't I leave? Well, you did leave, just now. Out into the stairwell, at least. You left, but you came back. In a more big picture sense, Severance has an unraveling mystery that we've only touched the tip of the iceberg with, and a pretty scathing critique of late stage capitalism. It's like Lost meets r slash anti-work, or how I personally watch The Office. But the good thing about the American dream is that you can just go to sleep and try it all again the next night. It's called the American dream because you have to be asleep to believe it. But what blows me away the most about Severance is how the show uses its spaces to disorient us. On a show that is spatially separated, of course it makes sense and is important that these spaces feel as different for us as they do for the characters on the show. The maze-like hallways make you feel both claustrophobic and lost. Macro data refinement places our main characters in a room so spacious that they feel more isolated than ever. And the break room gives a whole new meaning to the word break. I'm afraid you don't mean it. Excuse me? Again, please. And because of that mystery, Severance's use of space is doubly important, something that serves to ground us while still exploring ideas that different places represent. But how do they work? Why do we feel so unsettled by the spaces of Severance? And how does it relate to the ideas the show is working with? So let's take a spoiler-free look at how Severance uses space and design to explore its complex themes of alienation, capitalism, and defiant jazz? Entering into Lumen's severed floor is disorienting. This transition shot is probably the most iconic of the series, a dolly zoom, where the camera is moved towards its subject while also zooming out. The result is an unsettling effect that changes the depth of field while the character's face stays in the middle of the frame. It quite literally warps space around them and signals to us the change between Innie and Audi. But the elevator is just the beginning. From there, we enter a maze of hallways, with inexplicable crimps and turns. 
they're white and sterile. Something that constantly reminds me of the fact that these characters have been subjected to a medical procedure to lobotomize them from the hell that is work. It's like walking through an empty void crossed with the hedge maze from The Shining. But we spend most of our time inside Lumen in macro data refinement, MDR for short, where our main characters, Mark, Helly, Dylan, and Irving, spend hours, really their entire lives, sifting through incomprehensible numbers on a computer screen and finding the ones that make them feel bad. That, that's not me using flowery language, that's, the, that's their literal job description. So, uh, Cat1 numbers, for example, feel a certain way on site. They'll be sort of disconcerting, scary. Scary. I know. My job is to scroll through this spreadsheet and look for numbers that are scary. It sounds dumb and Mark said it dumb. Sounds to me like their actual job description is consultant. <laughs> that was awful. <laughs> I hope that joke makes the final cut. <laughs> While it sounds like a totally ridiculous way to explain their job, it also very much describes the room they're in as well. There are a lot of subtle touches to this room that make it feel scary. There is the obvious overhead lighting, triggering to most of us who have ever worked in a corporate office before, but they're also combined with a low ceiling, something that is only further emphasized by the sheer size of this room. MDR is often shot with anamorphic lenses, specifically vintage Panavision C-series lenses for all you gear sickos out there. These lenses do two important things to affect the space that play a big role in cultivating this mood. The first is that they have a wide aspect ratio, and the second is that the edge of the frame is more distorted and blurred. It gives the whole room a dreamlike and surreal effect, preventing us from feeling totally settled. And in the center of this gigantic football field sit our main characters, taking up the smallest amount of space, accentuating their isolation, and with their desks organized so that they're always watching each other in a never-ending circle of surveillance. But beyond layout, MDR's props add to this sense of unease. Production designer Jeremy Hindle told The Verge that he modeled MDR on the offices of the 1960s, drawing on a simple desk design and avoiding any props that might date the office. As for the computers our data refiners work on, they're newer than the 1960s, but they're still very retro in their size and shape, not unlike the Macintosh 2 of the late 1980s. And these computers are equipped not with a mouse, but with a trackball. This mishmash of temporal samples gives us a sense that we're untethered from time. More on that in a minute but it also plays heavily into the aesthetic of retrofuturism. Retrofuturism refers to an artistic movement that imagines the future from the perspective of the past. It asks the question, what did people think the future would look like? And in doing so, inherently draws on the tension between the past and the future. And again, the lens choice plays a role here. Anamorphic lenses are often used to create a feeling of nostalgia, like in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood or Moonlight. The severance procedure itself is made up of a very similar tension. The idea of being able to block out the most grueling part of your life while still collecting a paycheck might sound freeing. A kind of utopian dream world. Imagine, a life full of weekends. But the reality is a lot different. That technology with its ability to empower can also imprison. A weekend just happened. Yeah. I don't even feel like I left. Yeah, that's how nights and weekends feel here. Like nothing. Well, you get used to it. I, mean, I find it helps to focus on the effects of sleep since we don't actually get to experience it. And it's not like life for the Audis is really living up to the potential of full-time weekends. Life on the outside for Mark is gloomy and cold. His house is lit only with practical lights. The only light coming from when he actually turns something on. Here's how the director of photography, Jessica Lee Gagne, described it in an interview with Newsshooter.com. If he goes into his house, the only way you see him is because he turned on a practical, you know? Like, you would never have, like, an uh, ambiance, which is very different than Devin and Rickens. They have an ambiance. Like, they're the type of people who enter their house and, like, Rick and would turn on 15 lamps to set the mood, you know, for the particular energy. But Mark doesn't bother. So if there's a light on, it's because he needs it to see. She's French, so it's okay she says ambiance like that. Characters are in perpetual night since that's the only time they're not at work. There's snow everywhere, but not the pretty snow, it's that ugly old street snow. The kind that's brown and crusty from constant exposure to dirt and gasoline. Audis are constantly in their cars or garages in the dark, scurrying from one place to the next in an incredibly empty world, perhaps best exemplified by the building of Lumen itself. Gigantic, 
and vacant. And Severance's retrofuturist style confronts us with both ideas. The promise of a better tomorrow powered by technology, and the dystopia the characters of Severance live within. All around them, you can see that dream, but it's faded, like something went wrong. The technology that promised to free these characters has only imprisoned them more fully. Something even further hinted at in the room of MDR by its green rug, and that allusion to the grass that these characters will never touch. You can see this unsettling retrofuturism in other pop culture right now, too. There's the Fallout and Bioshock video games, and more recently, Loki's TVA draws heavily on this aesthetic. Welcome to the Time Variance Authority. I'm Miss Minutes. But on Severance, retrofuturism serves to amplify one of the central themes of the show, an idea that I think is best described by cultural critic Mark Fisher. It's what he called the slow cancellation of the future. You see, over the past 50 years, and especially since the fall of the Soviet Union, the ideology of capitalism has become all-encompassing. Maybe you've heard the phrase, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. That's what they're talking about. In his book, Ghosts of My Life, Fisher expands on this new paradigm, explaining that the hyper-commodification of art in particular has filled popular culture with recycled old art, a world of endless reboots and sequels and remixes. What is it to be in the 21st century is to have 20th, 20th century culture on higher definition screens. Uh, or, or, you know, 20th century culture distributed by high speed internet, actually. I think we've all noticed this, right? We're on episode like 45 of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the Harry Potter franchise keeps going, and every year there's an old piece of IP being dusted off to make some more money. I mean, one of the biggest TV shows of the modern era is essentially a compilation of references to old 80s movies. Why are you Venkman? Because I'm Venkman. No, I'm Venkman. But deeper than general boredom, Fisher describes how this recycling has destroyed our very understanding of time. For Fisher, there's no such thing as retro anymore, because everything is recycled. We have no landmarks in our brains for time periods. Um, what I'm arguing is that, uh, that the thing that's disappeared is a sense of difference, or a sense of sp the specificity, uh, the sense of culture belonging to a specific moment. That is what has disappeared. So there's now a feeling that nothing ever really dies, but that's not good. That means that we are um, assailed on all sides by kind of zombie forms, which persist forever uh, by revivals. Anything can come back. Severance isn't making any overt references to Mark Fisher, and maybe this all sounds like some high-minded academic bullshit. Page 197 slaps. But in all seriousness, I think the spaces of Severance are tapping into the same ideas that Fisher was discussing. Our characters are literally having their sense of time warped by a corporation seeking to exploit them for profit. And this is why that retrofuturist look is so potent on Severance. Lumen feels completely untethered from time, sampling from the Mad Men era offices of the 1950s, the computers of the 1980s, the cubicles of the 1990s, and the fashion of the 1970s. The result is a deeper sense of sadness and nostalgia. This isn't just for the aesthetic, it's a constant reminder of lost futures and broken promises, which is at the core of Severance's story. I really like the way Epic Philosophy describes this idea of lost futures in their video, Ghosts of Mark Fisher. We are haunted by these lost futures that never arrived. Things like socialism, emancipatory technology, a better world that was supposed to come. A world that was supposed to build off of the new art we saw in the 20th century. A world that was supposed to build off some emancipatory success of social democracy. Instead, we got a world that is in material degradation. It's a great video and I've linked it below if you've got a hankering for theory and want to learn more about Mark Fisher. Severance's spaces aren't just there to look cool. They make us feel disoriented, questioning when and where this show takes place. They make us feel claustrophobic and confused, running around endless, twisting hallways and never being able to escape. They make us feel isolated by the sheer amount of empty space. And most of all, they make us feel sad. They remind us not just of how much work sucks, but also of the hopes for a better future that were shattered in the process. It feels hopeless on an existential level. The sense that there is no getting better. That this is all there ever has been because everything is always corrupted by capital. The simplest distillation of this entire dynamic sits smack dab in the middle of MDR, where our innies work in a joint cubicle space. 
Funnily enough, the cubicle is a bastardization of Robert Probst's idea of the action office, a revolutionary workplace he designed in the 1960s where you could move from station to station. It was supposed to be freeing for workers, but was turned into the emblem of depression everywhere. In the interest of capitalism and, and making things quicker, easier, faster, you end up with components that facilitate less customization. Gone were the days of working for a lifetime at one major company that offered great benefits and a comfortable retirement package. Instead, layoffs, outsourcing, and cost-cutting meant employment could suddenly end at any time. The cubicle enabled this more fluid workspace on a logistical level. The cubicle's equal but opposite, the open plan office, was also corrupted from its original design in the pursuit of optimizing square footage and real estate value. And then they lied to you and told you that it was better for collaboration. <laughs> But Wright's open office was very different from the open drudgery in, say, 1960s The Apartment. Oh. People eliminated Wright's careful design work and made a copy of a copy of a copy. Open, but without Wright's genius behind it. Open offices are about saving money. Pricey real estate means that every square foot's a dollar sign. An MDR is the worst of both worlds, simultaneously a cubicle and an open plan office all while wrapped in the visual language of the original promise these ideas held. I think that many of us are much more aware of spaces now than we were two to three years ago. The pandemic forced us out of many spaces, making the world a weird and surreal, as the nerd writer called it, immense museums of strangeness. Most palpably, this change happened at work, with everyone who could choosing to work from home. And I don't think that it's a coincidence that the Great Resignation has been kicked off in part due to a resistance to go back to that world. But those same cultural and technological changes that make remote work possible are actually also helping to reinforce exploitation. Studies show that remote employees are working more than ever before. Tech companies are notorious for their perks. Free dinner, only available if you stay past six. Shuttles with Wi-Fi, so you can work through your commute and bring your pet to work policies so that you never have to go home. Gig economy apps like Uber promised workers the ability to choose their own hours, but hundreds of surveys of gig workers conducted by Professor Vina Dubal imply that their algorithm behaves like a casino app, trying to keep drivers on the road as long as possible by steering pricey trips away from them and stopping them short of their weekly goals. And in this case, it's not the high of the sort of joy and fun of a gamble, it's literally to keep going so that you can put food on the table. And these things happen to where the company realizes like, oh, Vina stops driving after she hits $150. So she must need to make $150 to make ends meet. So as I get closer to making $150, I get fewer and fewer rides. Holy shit. Because they want to keep me on in this, That's like, horrible. you know, working for as long as possible in case they need me. Severance is a show that takes these dynamics and bakes it into its premise, its characters, and even its physical spaces. Everywhere you look, the show is using its rooms to drive home these feelings of isolation, alienation, and lost futures. At a time when I think we're all thinking about physical spaces more and more. On a show that tells us so little about the actual mystery plot that's unraveling, these are really big ideas and concepts told almost entirely through the show's incredibly strong sense of spatial design. I think that's special, not just because it looks cool, but because there are so many layers to peel back. We might be living in a world full of recycled content, a kind of zombie culture, but at least Severance feels like it belongs to now. If you like art that captures a specific time and place, I'd recommend the documentary I Am Secretly an Important Man. It's a film about Jesse Bernstein, a Seattle poet and performance artist who, before his untimely death, was known as the godfather of grunge, with his art influencing the likes of Nirvana and Soundgarden. His art is very much of 1980 Seattle, and helps contextualize a lot of the emotions that later artists would build on, and you can check it out on MUBI. MUBI is a curated streaming service where you can watch interesting and incredible cinema from around the globe. Yeah, that's right, it's so good that even the TV guy is endorsing it. One of the coolest things about MUBI is that it can transport you on a tour of time and space. You're always in great hands with MUBI's excellent team of curators, and their catalog is filled with stuff from all over. 
Just as Severance feels like a show about the present in America, Mubi can transport you to other places and eras with art that captures those feelings. And you can try Mubi free for 30 days at Mubi.com slash skip intro. That's M-U-B-I dot com slash skip intro for a whole month of great cinema for free. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, you can share, you can like, you can subscribe. I mean, why not subscribe? You'll probably forget you did it later, but it's the entire foundation of my self-esteem. You can also waltz over onto Patreon to support the channel there and get your name in the credits, like these beautiful people scrolling across your screen. There you get the inside scoop on bigger projects I'm working on, including the ever-hyped, finally scheduled video about copaganda in Paw Patrol. That will be coming at some time this summer. Ooh. Thanks again, and I'll talk at you again soon.